be a fun panel. <laughs> it's gonna be a fun and exciting panel. I'm so excited. Um, so, Yay. oh, I have to tell everyone in my household too. Like, I'm doing a panel. <laughs> tell all the cats to be quiet, and then of course they won't listen. Oh, the babies <laughs> have been. Oh my god, the kittens. They run out like 101 Dalmatians when we get ready and feed them. So when they're jumping off stuff, and the way they jump off stuff isn't like the way like older cats jump off. Like, yeah, I'm gonna jump and leap. No, they jump like this. <laughs> <laughs> they just like, like squirrels and like spider cats. And I'm like, what are you doing? I'm not raising you to go to someone else's house to like jump like that like they are they're hilarious and they're, i know we're starting you know. now but just very quickly moya you need to teach me how to do your scarf like that because when i tie it it always looks terrible i always look like, <laughs> I always look like i'm bald-headed like i don't have enough hair under there oh so my God. <laughs> she said she wants you bald head <laughs> she did <laughs> i look like that i look like yeah like there's nothing holding it up but it looks so like deflated when i try it so i don't know what it is <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to put something on top if you if you don't have the puffy hair. Okay. So just have to, fake it. I have to fake it till I make it the categories with you. <laughs> Precious, look at me. She said, girl. All right, ladies Ashley, and gentlemen. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, actually, I'm now obsessed with the fact that you and Simone Biles are the same size. Like, I want to see you do these vaults and, and like, vertical splits, girl. <laughs> I will never reveal my 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 size to you now. <laughs> now I feel like at five foot two, I'm just like, yeah, that's right. Mm. <laughs> All right, y'all, let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, wherever you are in the world, for our cultural astronomy panel, aka for the culture panel. Today we have a science communicator. In folk Florida's, we have a outreach expert, and we also have an astronomy education researcher as well. And what do they all have in common? Well, they black. So we want to make sure that we talk about uh, talk about us and being a part of the diaspora, and what does the diaspora um, needs, wants, and how we view things, right? Because we're all at different parts of the world with different backgrounds, all of this, you know, all of this blackness being here. So with that being said, without further ado, um, I'm gonna have my first uh, panelists introduce themselves on my screen. And so go ahead, Dr. Moira McTeer. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Dr. Moira McTeer. I'm an astrophysicist. I got my PhD uh, a few years ago studying galactic habitable zones, but in college I also studied folklore. And so now I get to do full-time science communication, which is my dream. And I do that by combining astro and folklore wherever possible. All right, Dr. Joseph. Hi everyone, my name is Tana Joseph. I am a South African astronomer. I'm currently based in England, but I'm actually coming to you today from Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, and I, yeah, I focused on, in my research career, I focused on high energy astrophysics. So I studied small black holes with a star going around them. And now I work in public engagement, science communication, equity, diversity and inclusion, and decolonization for the sciences. And Dr. Makawala. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. I am Tia Miso Makwela. I'm joining from South Africa in Cape Town. And I'm currently an astronomy education researcher. I did my PhD in astronomy education at the University of Cape Town, the university at the bottom of the mountain or the foot of the mountain, something like that. It's not really hard to find if you Google Table Mountain. Um, so that's who I'm joining from. And I do astronomy education research, which is something that I'm definitely passionate about because it's through this um, AER work that you are able to create an astronomy curricula that is much more inclusive, diverse, and has all elements that include everyone else. So ensuring that 
astronomy and space are actually for everyone, even in practice. Well, thank you all so much for those lovely introductions. Um, and I just want to say, I just want to shout out right now um, the African continent because you all are the home of astronomy. You all are the birth of us, the black folk, the black folks. We amazing, okay. And I also am excited to see um, that not only is this Black Space Week, but I think we're going to end up taking up the whole summer because in August, I just saw that they announced that it's going to be African Astronomy Month. And so, like, again, the summer is for Black folks, okay, y'all? It's for us. And so I'm really, really excited about that. With that being said, we're going to segue um, into y'all's back background. And so tell us a little bit about yourself, your childhood, your education, um, and how did you um, get into astronomy? And so we're going to start with uh, Dr. Joseph. Um, okay, I like telling the story, I will admit. Um, it's, it's fun for me to reminisce about uh, my childhood and how it led to where I am today. So I grew up in Cape Town and where uh, CI is right now, um, but far from home. And um, when I was about 11 years old, I decided to become an astronomer. And it was because of Hubble legacy images that um, were being published in newspapers. So for those of you who are young, go ask your parents what a newspaper is, but we used to sell <laughs> these big pieces of paper that were folded in together and every day the news would be printed on them. <laughs> And after they fixed the Hubble telescope, because uh, they put Hubble in space and then they found out it was actually broken and they sent some astronauts to fix it, we got these incredibly beautiful images and they would print them on the front page of the newspaper. Um, and I would see these images and my dad would buy the newspaper and I would read the articles that came along with it. And I decided that I wanted to be like the scientists who use these pictures to learn oh. about space. And something that I didn't really appreciate when I was younger and it's only now um, over the last few years that I really having told the story so many times I really thought about this was that uh, when I was this age and this um, discovery of astronomy was happening was also the time when South Africa was going through this enormous cultural and political change so this was in the mid 90s in South Africa mm -hmm. So the front page of the newspaper was chock-a-block full of Nelson Mandela, the world's most <laughs> beloved politician, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, how South Africa will be international darlings of uh, politics because we had gone from transitioning from apartheid, um, where I went to a race segregated school when I was very young, to you know um, a peaceful process of uh, democracy and all this stuff. And that was all on the front page, as you can imagine, of the newspapers. But Hubble, these Hubble images were so undeniably spectacular mm. that they would sometimes be on the front page, even though we were talking about very serious politics. And so these kind of things kind of went together for me as a child. And also the country was so full of hope and joy and this feeling that anything is possible. And I think that really contributed to me saying, you know, as a 11 year old girl, um, without any role models, without the internet, people often ask me, who are your science role models? I don't have any uh, because I didn't grow up with them, but I was surrounded by a country that was in this very special, amazing moment with all these positive feelings around it that it influenced me to be able to say I'm going to study space I'm going to be an astronomer um, I'm going to do these incredible things and I didn't know what they were yet but the environment was really perfect for me to to make that massive leap and so at 11 years old I decided to be an astronomer and I worked towards that goal for almost 20 years and I uh, got my PhD in 2013 and I was very privileged to have a 10 year research career and now I spend a lot of my time trying to make the research environment, especially in the sciences, better for people who don't fit the typical mold of what you think a scientist looks like when you Google scientists and all these old white men come up and we're trying to change that. So I spend a lot of my time working to change that um, from a decolonization perspective as well, because there's a lot to unpack um, in astronomy when it comes to science as a tool of colonization. Thank you for that. Dr. Makawawa? 
Um, yeah, um, such an inspirational story, Tana, because Tana comes into my story later as well. <laughs> so I was very, gosh, I was so fascinated literally by the moon. And that's just really how my journey started. Um, I, you know, I said to my mom, you know, this thing is really fascinating. Sometimes it's small, sometimes it's big, sometimes it's not there at all. Like what's really happening with that? And because that used to be a fascination of mine and I was very young and my mom knew we have to go outside every single night to look at the moon. And that's when I started recognizing that, oh, the moon has actually it has sisters, there's stars and, and everything else there. And then I asked my mom, uh, you know, what I want to go there. I want to go see what's happening there. And my mom said, no one goes there. So that was the first thing. No one goes there. So, you know, you, you can't want to go there at all. And I remember saying, but why not? Why not? And then my mom said, maybe there are people who actually work with the moon. And I said, okay, then I want to work with the moon. And then my mom said, what would you be doing if you're working with the moon? And I said, I would be a doctor and I would be the doctor of the moon. <laughs> And um, there was me really young that I started calling myself Dr. Moon. And I think that's why I'm still Dr. Moon on Twitter, because that's the actual story <laughs> of how this whole came about. It was really because I just really was fascinated by the moon and I wanted to work with the moon. And I remember that um, when I was in grade three, which is, I don't know what it is in the context of the US, like, so it's like, yeah, grade three. Three, grade, three years into school <laughs> we were doing <laughs> we were doing um something called HSS at that time human social sciences and in that human social sciences in grade three in room 11 and I don't know why I remember the room number but in my grade three year um, we were learning about the space race and it was for the first time that I even came across the word astronaut and I was just like, if these people really went to the moon, <clears throat> then means there is a possibility of me going to the moon. So I asked to borrow for that book because, again, you know, in South Africa, because of apartheid, there were so many resources that children could have. So I only had a textbook at school. But that day, I asked the teacher to go home with this textbook to show my mom that actually there's a name for the doctors of the moon. You know, they're called astronauts and they go to the moon. Um, and for me, that's where the love of astronomy just unfolded for me. Um, I started reading newspapers a lot more. Um, and I, I saw so many news about astronomy and astronauts. And then Mark Shuttleworth then went to space, you know, at some point, and he was all over the news. And then salt came into being, and that was all over the news, but also in newspapers. So to this day, I still have cut off of newspapers of when salt was getting built that, you know, the first time I saw salt, I was just like, it's real. Oh my goodness. Because it was really something that I saw when I was very young. Um, and so that's where I started. I just wanted to, to be the doctor of the moon. I wanted to do astronomy. And all I did in, in my younger years was do everything about astronomy. My mom's friends used to buy newspapers a lot and they would literally annotate pages on the newspaper. So they'd come and bring newspapers at home and they'll write page 27 for Tiamiso, you know? And in those pages, I'd see things about the moon, the stars, um, telescopes, the Hubble telescope, salt, all of those news would just come up from those newspapers. And so, my community also, you know, my mom's friends always asked me, so why are we seeing an eclipse today? And then they started to ask me and I became like this, this expect telling them, no, you, you need to have a fall if you want to look at an eclipse. You need to have this, this, if you want to do that. Um, and that was really me in primary school and going forward. And I remember in grade 10, um, in, in grade 10, this is where we choose our subjects. What do you want to major in uh, for your career from then on? So they started grade, grade 10. 10. In grade 10, so you have to choose a subject. So you're either choosing the science stream, accounting stream, or humanities. And so when I got into grade 10, like everyone is just all about doing engineering and all of those things. And all I wanted to do was go to Cape Town to do astronomy. Because <laughs> at that point, I knew the only place to do astronomy in the whole country was in Cape Town. 
And that's all I wanted to do, go to Cape Town to do astronomy. But of course, you know, when you finish grade 12, my mom said I was just too young. I had to stay close to home. So then I just studied my physics and my mathematics at the University of Vedvatosrand, which is in Joburg. And in my first year, I started, you know, being more active on Facebook. And then I started seeing Tana's post on Facebook about NASP. And <laughs> NASP, which is the National Astronomy uh, and Astrophysics Space Science Program, which, you know, is really an amazing program, which, which also has a really long legacy on bringing, um, you know, or growing astronomy in the country. I mean, since NASP and now we have about 400 and something graduates, astronomy graduates. And at the beginning of NASP, there were only 20 astronomers in the country and they were all white. And because of that program, there've been a really a spread of diversity, women, men, and not just in South Africa, but across all Africa. So that's when I first saw the name Tana Joseph. It was on Facebook, 2012, 2013. Tana was posting a lot on Facebook about NASP. And I was just like, I need to go to Cape Town. <laughs> And finally, I came to Cape Town, and yeah, this is me now. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, that is an incre incredibly cute story, and it's so adorable. My team is actually blowing up talking about their screaming and talking about how cute your story is. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. McTeer, go ahead. Um, yeah, the, both of those stories were really cute. I love how newspapers played a role there. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of a deviation. I didn't find astronomy until I was 18 in my second year of college. Um, so to back up, I grew up in Pennsylvania in a very rural part of, of the U S. Um, I actually grew up in a log cabin in the middle of the woods without running water. Um, and I was the only black person around and I was one of the only openly queer people around and I was smarter than everyone there and they hated me. So I knew I had to get out as fast as possible. And to me, the quickest ticket seemed to be education. So all I knew was that I wanted to get to the best college that I could get to. I honestly didn't even know what I wanted to study. Um, so I I made it out of my hometown. I went to Harvard for undergrad. And when I first got to campus, I was just kind of floundering around. Um, I had always been really interested in mythology and folklore. And I happened to live across the street from the mythology building. So I found that right away and, and knew I wanted to study that. And it took me longer to find astronomy. What happened was one of my rugby teammates dragged me with her to an astronomy class. I was uninterested, but the professor said we'd get free pizza every week. So I signed up because I was a broke college student. And by the end of the semester, it was a class on galactic astronomy. And by the end of the semester, I was hooked by the content. I just thought it space was really interesting, but also the way we talk about space is really interesting. So I didn't know it at the time, but there was that little seed of science communication bl uh, blossoming in me. Um, I finished college, I decided to be strategic and get my PhD in astro because it seemed like I'd have more job opportunities than with folklore. But by the end, actually pretty soon in grad school, I realized I didn't want to stay in academia. And so I started intentionally ramping up my science communication work. And by the time I graduated in 2021, I was doing SciComm full time and lying to my advisors about how much research I was doing. And so I was able to um, make it a full time career and start my own business in 2021 doing SciComm full time. So that's that's me in a nutshell. Thank you so much for that, uh, Moya. Yeah, that was definitely the opposite direction. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely the opposite direction. But you and I met during, you and I met towards what the end of your undergrad. So I, I kind of so, yeah. like, yeah, we met kind of towards the end of your undergrad. So like that was like that experience. And then I saw you on TV and I was just like, oh wow, she's doing psychom. That's like so cool, right? <laughs> and so ever since then, obviously I've been following your psychom journey. We are Astro sisters. So I mean, there was fate there. And so um, and we're all family here, right? With that being said, um, because all of you have went into the second question. Good job, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> all of you went into the second question. So with that being said, cultural astronomy is super interdisciplinary. Um, 
And Moya walked us right through this one. And so like, what disciplines do you uh, combine your astronomy, um, your astronomy with to do your research or your work? Uh, we can start with Dr. Matier. Yeah, so I, I studied both astro and folklore and mythology in college. As a folklorist, my specialties were ritual body modification. So I spent a, a lot of classes and a lot of time learning about tattooing and piercing rituals from around the world, but also just learning about how cultures form and what the like function of different stories is and why we need them as societies. And uh, I also bring a lot so because I studied stories that cultures told throughout time, I feel like I've gained a lot of storytelling skills that are really helpful in science communication. Uh, so I, I definitely bring that in. I try to bring in comedy and humor. Uh, I've been in the comedy science communication scene in New York for like eight years, which is a, a, a really fun niche. And um, also like humility and understanding. I, I think one of the great things my folklore background gives me is the ability to like empathize and and connect with people uh, from different backgrounds on different levels. Because as a science communicator, I don't just want to like jam science into people's heads. Like that's not the best way to actually share it. The best way is to get them to grab it themselves. And they do that when they feel a personal connection to it. So if I can say, you know, we've studied galaxies and stars, but here are the stories that some of your ancestors believed, or here are the ways that astronomy impacts your daily life now, even though we have all this technology, that's what's going to get them interested. So those are the ingredients I use. Perfect. Dr. Makawala? Um, actually, you can say Tia. Tia works for you perfect as well. So <laughs> okay, Tia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so for me, I would even just say astronomy itself is interdisciplinary. So, you know, I would frame it as that already that we see, you know, astronomy having, you know, a finger in many other science disciplines. Um, and before I you know, sound like I'm trying to advocate for what my job does, let me speak about how I combine what other disciplines. Um, so in my, in my work and in my research work, I, I combine a lot of astronomy with cognitive science and neuroscience. So in a, in a way that I, I relate to how we think in our brains when we are met with scientific content. So what in our brains is being activated when we are thinking about certain astronomical aspects and concepts. And we started this with, you know, just learning the scales. So the distances, the how big things are. And, you know, for me, it was really new territory coming into cognitive science, but I've kind of enjoyed it because I realized how our brains have different modes of thinking that we switch to in different when we are met with different things. And that also applies in astronomy. You know, when we are met with numbers and things that are unfamiliar, we tap into a different side of our cognitive thinking that we use. And so one of the lenses that I really enjoy using a lot more is called embodied cognition, saying that, you know, uh, one of its sessions and my most favorite one is that all abstract thought is physical. So all of these uh, thoughts that are abstract, you know, astronomy as a subject on its own, there, there's a moment in time when it's really abstract, but we are able to understand its abstractions because of our physical connection to it. And so our senses, our hearing, our touching, all of those things combined together, um, I use that lens of cognitive science into understanding astronomy, as well as neuroscience in terms of what wires together normally fires together. So we want to know where is this wiring happening? You know, um, one of the best examples I've gotten also for embodied cognition was that in many times in our everyday lives, we'll speak about love and we'll say that we are in love or out of love, meaning that we see love as something that we can contain into something. And that really comes from our own experiences of having something being contained into something. Water is in a glass and we pour it out and it's no longer in there. So we are in or out of love. So I bring some of those things into astronomy and into understanding of some concepts in astronomy. Yeah. That was so cool. Yeah, thank you for that, Tia. Also, I just want to tell you, Tia, that... Caprice is fangirling, okay? My vice president is fangirling over you at the current <laughs> moment, just to let you know. So she probably will be asking you 
throughout the rest of the year, do you want to do stuff with us? So I'm probably going to get the, we're probably going to have those conversations. <laughs> I'm definitely reaching out to ask if you want to be on my podcast. <laughs> Tyler, go ahead. So I guess since I'm speaking last, it's my turn to sort of be the outlier um, and say that uh, my entire formal education has been in physics and astronomy and um, the other aspects that I bring to my research work and is the things around science communication, um, which is largely self-taught, so learning by experience. And I'm also a graduate of Twitter University before is the way that it is now. Um, uh, a lot of my work around decolonization, equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, and all that that entails uh, came from being in community on in certain social media settings. Um, I'm saying Black Twitter. I'm trying to say Black Twitter in a fancy way, like uh, Moya and Sia um, were saying all their fancy stuff. And so uh, for me, I really had to grapple with this because, because I had spent my entire, the first 20 years of my adult life informal education um, or informal education settings or research settings um, I have I have this you know strong belief that um, the only way you can learn things is at university or in the classroom or by writing exams and getting certificates but as I started my decolonization learning and unlearning and practice I genuinely believe that being in community with people and listening to stories, hearing people's lived experiences and sharing um, is a, a valid way to figure out how the world works, how the universe works. And so I have resisted getting sort of a formalized, certified way of um, understanding the aspects of decolonization that are uh, that need to happen in astronomy. And so I learned by talking to others who are doing the practice. I still, I read a lot, um, but a lot of this happens on social media or in articles and things like that. I'm not publishing yet. Um, I would hope to at some point, uh, but a lot of it, yeah, it's it's sort of informal work, but it's been incredibly valuable. Um, it's been incredibly eye-opening. I have been dragged on uh, Black Twitter, which is it should be everyone's worst fear. Um, that has happened to me. I've been called out publicly and um, it took me a couple of months to recover, but it made me a better person and it made me check myself um, and, and think more critically and think more empathetically about the work that I'm doing and about astronomy's place in the world as a science, how we practice it, who gets to practice it, where the resources are and why we do astronomy in the way that we do it when astronomy is one of those things that as we've kind of touched on already is so universal, um, not just to human beings, but to various sentient beings on this planet rely on the night sky looking a certain way to literally guide their lives, guide the times, their movements, their sense of self, and how we as human beings and our study of the universe changes that and impacts that. That was so beautifully said. Like, I mean, we're all here gathered here because again, like I said in the beginning, in the most in the most simplest terms that I could think of that we're black and we like to study astronomy and we also love our culture right and so something that and you you know i'm sorry i had to laugh when you said you got dragged on twitter girl i had to you know we joke around a lot <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> however right we you know we have this world view of what we think astronomy should look like and how our ancestors set, how our ancestors performed um, mm -hmm. things through the astronomical lens. For example, for um, Moya and I, our families had to use the North Star to get out of slavery. And for you all, I'm pretty sure that you all were using it for farming and things of that nature. And also how this helped, um, how this helped. Um, you all navigate as well because it wasn't just African Americans that needed it to navigate. You all had to use it. Um, Africans had to use it to navigate too, probably at nighttime. And so, with that being said, historically we've been taught that this is through the European lens, which we all know is not true. Um, 
And today we're focusing on Black people as a community, as a whole. What are some interesting astronomical views from other cultures that you would like to share with our audience? And I'm going to start with Tia. Yeah. Yeah. Um... For me, if there is some one of the views that I take, I take from my grandmother. Um, so, you know, because of the different histories, I'll just explain a little bit where she grew up in. So she she grew up in a place in Gauteng. I forgot the name previously, but it is closer to uh to almost what we call the north of Joburg. And with time, my grandmother and and her family were then, you know forcefully removed from that section by, by the apartheid regime into another place. Um, but she was saying that they used to look at the moon um, during those times as well. And if the moon was in a crescent that looked downwards, it meant that it was going to be a bad day for them. Um, it meant that they had to be at home earlier because they could either be, you know, lashes or something. They could be arrested for being on the roads after night. So things like that. So she used to tell me that it just meant bad fortune for them. Just looking at the moon in that way, uh, which symbolizes bad fortune. Um, and then she also told me this one, which kind of sticked with me because she told me this one when I was a little bit older. And I said, what can you see inside the moon? So I asked my grandmother this, what can you actually see inside the moon? And she said, well, I see a woman carrying a baby on her back, also with a log. So with uh, carrying logs of trees so that she can go make fire to keep her family warm when it's a full moon. And I think that's one of really the nicest stories that she told me because I've never seen that woman with a baby on her back. <laughs> what I see inside there is totally different um, from what she has, has really seen. But just to say, one of those things was that in within the full moon and seeing that woman with the baby on the back, for her, it also meant a good time to have with family. So she would gather every single one of them around to have a good time together while the full moon is out there because it will also give them the amazing light that they would need where it was normally dark. So that's one of some of the stories that I think it was really a nice view of, 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 of astronomy back then um, because also they didn't have street lights. So once there's a full moon, they're a little bit more safer than they would have been. Yeah. Moya, go ahead. Yeah, this, um, I, I love that answer. I love when, when people have personal stories that say how they respond to different cycles in nature, beautiful. Um, this question makes me think of two things. One, first and foremost, is the the idea that a lot of what we consider kind of astronomy lore canon that comes from like European people actually came from African people before then. Uh, so the the constellations that we have now, a lot of the names that we use for things come to us from old white European dudes who were naming stuff, but they got their naming conventions from the Romans, who got it from the Greeks, who got it from the Egyptians, who got a lot of stuff from ancient Babylonians and Mesopotamians. So that area of like Northern Africa, the Middle East, is where so much of our European uh, astronomy view comes from. And yet we still have whitewashed it by saying it's European. Like the so many of the constellations we have, the uh, Taurus, Cancer, um, like Gemini, we can trace those constellations back 10,000 years or more. We know that the ancient Babylonians believed in them. So that's that's pretty cool. The other thing that um, this question brought to mind was just the literally different view that a lot of uh, Africa and other people in the global south have of the night sky than people in the north because so much of astronomy is northern hemisphere centric. Um, but one of the most beautiful things about the southern sky is that the, the south part of the earth points towards the, the galactic plane and the galactic center. So they have a much more beautiful view of all of the dark rifts in the sky. They can see the large and small Magellanic clouds. And they have often in, in the southern hemisphere, there's this practice of seeing constellations in those dark rifts instead of making constellations from co connecting dots of light. And I've usually seen this in like South America and in uh, Australian indigenous groups. But I did look up if there were dark constellations for uh, different African um, ethnic groups. And I found I found one 
example of people saying that the the coal sack nebula, uh, this kind of dark uh, inky void in the Milky Way, uh, they call it something like the, like the old the old bag um, of of something the the old bag of the night. And um, like I, I just love that there is lore both in what we can't see in the sky and in what we can see. So that's a a good lesson I think that we can learn from other indigenous um, groups and from African star lore. Can I can I also add on to something while you're mentioning that you know mentioning the beauty of the the southern sky um, is the fact that actually this they they tried documenting this with. Um, a show, a planetarium show. I forgot the name of the planetarium show. I'll get it before the end of this. But you know, they were showing how the Milky Way came to being from uh America, from from these indigenous stories from the Khoisan group where they were sitting around a fire and then you know they took one of the coals and threw it into the sky and then the Milky Way came by. Like once you see how beautiful the Milky Way looks out there you really see how that story actually could be true because it's 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 so you need to see it you just have to see it's one of the most beautiful things that you you'll never get over once you once you see the first time the second time you see it it'll be like the first time again so it's really really beautiful yeah i love so that you're telling us to take a trip is what you're telling because <laughs> yes, you know we like trips Yes, 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 please do. Take a trip to <laughs> South Africa and then we'll go out the mountain to see the Milky Way. And okay. the small the, the LMC and the SMC, you can literally just see them. They're just like out there. Stunning. <laughs> okay, so to my Black and National team in the community, we need to schedule a field trip to Africa. That mm -hmm. is our next plan. That's where we're going to have 2025 Black Space Week. So that's, that's set in stone. <laughs> Um, go ahead, Tana. <laughs> no, man, Tia, man, you stole my story. I was going to tell the story about the girl <laughs> the fire into the sky. <laughs> That's like my one of my favorite ones. I love it because it's female-centric. Because um, mm -hmm. they, they specified it wasn't a woman. It was a girl who was sitting at the fire. And she scooped it up, apparently in a fit of anger. I think she was reprimanded by a man or something. And she scooped up the contents of the fire that included um, some edible roots and things. And she flung the contents of the fire up into the sky and the ash became the kind of the white stars of the Milky Way and the yeah. um, hot coals became, yeah. Yes. Became like <laughs> uh, like juice and the red stars. And I just really like that one, like I say, because it's female centric that, you know, this fundamental, crucial, exquisite structure in the universe, in our night sky, that means so much to so many people was the creation of a, of a girl. And as well, the Milky Way as um, uh, sort of the tribes in, in what is now North South Africa or um, Southern uh, Zimbabwe or parts of Botswana in the South as well, um, have this idea that the Milky Way is a um, a pathway. It's this beautiful lighted like, pathway that the anc departed ancestors walk on. Mm -hmm. um, in heaven and it kind of really speaks to that connection that we have um, with our past with our elders and something that's universal I, so as far as I have experienced around the world in black culture is the reverence for your elders mm -hmm. and that kind of links in with that as well I fear on this earth um, only one thing and that is my um, <laughs> my mother being angry with me so that is <laughs> me um, <laughs> a lot this idea that you know we have this reverence that you look into the sky and see this beautiful majesty and you know that that's your connection to your elders to your departed ancestors to those who came before you um and you can think about that every time you look at the sky which is the cultural heritage like i said of every loving thing that can perceive light um on this planet those are beautiful stories and i'm just cracking up right now and the reason I look down and I'm me and the team are cracking up right now because of shout out to our Astro Bite writers um, that are live tweeting this right now. They I we are screaming because of the translation <laughs> to what Moya said. <laughs> Moya, we sent it to you and I can send it to all of y'all, but it is okay. hilarious. Shout out to our Astro Bite writers for doing this for us. <laughs> On to the next question. Astronomy has played a huge role in our society. 
why was this important to ancient civilizations and how does this affect us in today's society? And I'm going to start with Tana. So we've already spoken about, like Ashley said, we kind of keep getting ahead of ourselves in the questions. Um, perceiving the night sky, whatever you want to call it, astronomy or um, stargazing, or it plays a crucial role in societies and civilizations throughout the world because it's um, fundamentally, it's a, it's a way to keep time. It's a way to unify people in time. Um, it tells you when to harvest, when to plant, when, when it's safe to go certain places, um, which things need to happen culturally at certain times. Um, and also as a, uh, as obviously as a crucial navigation aid. Um, and so these are, these are some of the fundamental things that you need to establish to have unity and cohesion in a society and to, you know, to work together and to make sure that everyone is safe and can thrive and all that kind of stuff. And so having something that we can all perceive and, and, and have a connection with is so fundamentally important so that we can, um, yeah, so that we can form a society and stop being individuals and work together for the greater good, whatever that common cause is, and to bind people together on a spiritual level as well. Um, the, you know, in more modern times, the Bible and the Quran and um, a lot of religious texts talk about, you know, um, the, there's a creation story and that's also wrapped up in space as well. We're trying to figure out how the universe got to be where it was. And so for many people looking up at the sky and studying what's in the heavens is also a, it's a very spiritual practice um, mm -hmm. as well. And so something that we often lose sight of when we get into what we call the hard sciences, like astrophysics, um, is that there is a spiritual connection to so many people with the sky. And it goes beyond just what we can explain and what our minds can understand. And I think that is something that in Western science especially um, is very separated, the, the science and the spirituality, whereas um, I'm so sure mm. I sure can attest to this, that um, in Africa, there's no, there's very little contention between being a person of faith and a person of science. You often see in a, an African scientist bio on social media, they'll say child of God and astrophysicist. And those two things go together. And it's very easy to see how that is um, in astronomy because it's very difficult to see the things that we see um, you know, with the technology that's available to us, but to all just with our naked eye, whether it's a shooting star or an eclipse um, or something, something looking a little different in the night sky than you're used to. Maybe the planets, the planets are set to align um, later this year as well. So we've had uh, a, a full solar eclipse that hundreds of millions of people saw as well as the planets aligning. Um, so there's a lot of fun stuff happening in the sky, but it's so difficult to look at that and not have a sense of, on a spiritual level, um, a, a sense of wonder come over you as well as scientific curiosity. See you. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just going to add on, on to what Tana said. Um, I think one of the things that, definitely astronomy has influenced, looking at the sky has influenced, it's also just our interconnectedness, not just with the night sky, but with each other as well. And this also brings me to, you know, when I was younger and probably years before, how communication was just so difficult for people, right? They would have to send letters before the rainy season starts. So obviously then they would look at the stars to know when that is happening. And then they send their letters so that they can communicate with their loved ones from far. Um, and just now today, our communication is much more easy and friendly because of really our curiosity with the stars so that we are able to create technologies that help us with moving forward today. Um, I, I like thinking about, you know, well, this, this specific question goes back very far for me because I remember when I was telling a teacher that I wanted to do astronomy and then the teacher said, some dreams are unrealistic, you know, like literally a teacher said that to me. No, 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 guys, some dreams are unrealistic. And then he said to me, how, how will this help people? How will this help black people? Uh, and I was really young when he was asking me that, but going forward, when I told other people that I, I'm doing astronomy and I want to do astronomy, they'd say, but how does that help people? But this 
all the time I go back to say, our world works well together today because of astronomy. We work well together today because of astronomy. We have amazing technological advances from things that we use in our homes to the Wi-Fi that we always ask for a password wherever we go to communicate with people. It's because of these affordances in astronomy. And not only are we spiritually connected with it, but because of that connection that we have with it, we are able to make advances that help us and our world become better. Yeah. Thanks. So my team has um, provided services to find this teacher for you. Um, <laughs> we just want to talk. We just want to have a conversation. No, I just want to come outside. Come outside. Come outside. <laughs> we ain't going to jump him. We ain't going to jump him. <laughs> We just want to talk. <laughs> Tana, go ahead. Wait, wait. No, wait, no. Tana just went. Moya, it's your turn. <laughs> yeah, well, I wipe away my tears over here. Uh, yes to absolutely everything that's been said. And the only thing I'll add is that um, we have been so disconnected from the night sky because of light and air pollution. Now, it approximately 80% of the sky is uh, like you can't see the stuff in space that our ancestors used to see. And so we've lost that connection, but I'm really encouraged by seeing people try to claw that connection back. Um, it, at least here in the US, there are more than 70 million people who read their horoscopes every day. So astrology is like a, a very big thing, people trying to get that connection back. Um, I, I can't go a day without seeing someone wear a NASA shirt on, on the street. Like people are interested in this, even in a casual way, even though they've lost that connection. So uh, I I just love the fact that astronomy continues to connect us, even when we have divorced ourselves from it in a natural way. Okay, I want to make sure I got all of you because that that just like threw me off, and I was just like, wait, wait, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Tana, we went to you, right? Okay, just making sure. Look, it threw the moderator off. Caprice, <laughs> don't say nothing else. Caprice, don't say nothing else. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> Africa, Africa's indigenous culture has graced us with ideology and ideologies and spiritualities to the universe, and how the building and how this sets the building blocks for Afro Afrofuturism. This sets the tone. If we think about some of the movies that have recently came out. One as recent as Black Panther, right? Has it fo has it focuses a strong feature on um, Afrofuturism? How has that affected today's uh, today's culture and um, society? Uh, we're gonna start with Tana. Um, I think it's come along. It's it's done a lot of good, and we've come a long way into kind of seeing Black people in this role of scientists, like you know, uh, Princess Shuri. Um, Please ignore the, the actress that plays the character. Let's focus purely on the fictional character. Um, um, you know, seeing her as like this hardcore scientist and seeing uh, seeing a, again her as a young woman take this role as a scientific leader in this very advanced African society um, is extremely gratifying. Um, and it's also very nice when people say to you, like, oh, you're like Shuri in Black Panther. And I'm like, yes, yes, I am. That's right. Uh, <laughs> I don't have the Marvel money, but I get the Marvel clout now, which is nice. Um, so even for me, it, it has a personal impact. And I think it's just really important to have that representation. And it's also interesting to see, I didn't really appreciate how, for instance, how tech savvy we are in South Africa with our reliance on cell phones. And mm -hmm. I don't mean to drag the US here, but it is very weird when I go to the US and I have to deal with checks because I'm like, why can't we just do cell phone banking? Like every, like we've been doing for the last 10, 15 years. What is this piece of paper? So <laughs> there's also maybe not so much an appreciation for how much tech there is in Africa, how very excited we are about innovative technology and to embrace that because we have all these challenges. Um, like in South Africa, we have a big problem with uh, electricity supply and things like that. And in other countries um, across the continent, uh, you know, there are all these challenges. Like Africa's I mean, the second largest landmass on the planet, and only about a billion people live there. 
a billion and a half people live in India, but only about a billion people live in the entire continent of Africa. There's a lot of open space and that alone presents a lot of logistical challenges. So the way that we use tech to overcome that and better our situation and innovate and develop things um, is, uh, is really incredible. It's really amazing to see in the context of astronomy. And for instance, the square kilometer array telescope that will be once it's complete, the biggest science experiment on the entire planet, sorry, Large Hadron Collider, um, mm -hmm. spreading across the continent um, has been incredible. The Ghanaians have um, a fantastic radio astronomy observatory. Um, there's obviously a lot of work that's been done in South Africa. Namibia is becoming a multi-wavelength um, hub where they will, where they have um, a lot, like a great setup for sub-millimeter astronomy, for radio astronomy, um, maybe even optical, and other countries doing the tech side um, of things. So like the data, big data processing hubs and things like that. So there's been a lot of development, specifically astronomy related, but just in general, there's an enormous appetite for it um, across the continent because we know we have these challenges and what works in other places doesn't necessarily work for us. So we're always having to um, yeah, find solutions and um, necessity is the mother of invention. So, and that's really playing out across the continent. Moya. Yeah. yeah, I uh, am gonna approach this from like a media lens because I've been seeing over the last, I'd say five to 10 years, a boom in Afrofuturist uh, fiction and in fiction inspired by by other cultures. And I think that's because people are getting sick of the classic themes and tropes of like Western narrative storytelling. And when you when you keep when you gatekeep access to publishing and, and to story distribution to just white folks, that's what's going to happen. You're going to get people who are sick of the same stories being told over and over. But when you can dig into other cultures, when you can dig into African cultures who have different themes, who have different ways of looking at narrative in general, uh, you can get new types of stories. And and I know we're going to talk about some like values and themes that we, we like from African and indigenous groups. But um, one thing that I love, and it's Pride Month, is the fact that, you know, queerness and duality, uh, the idea that multiple things can exist at once, is so present in a lot of African folklore and African cultures and indigenous cultures around the world. And that is something we need to see more of in stories. And we're starting to. And, and I think that can just be a benefit to our society today. Yeah. See ya. Yeah. And just... Also, Peg, bearing from just what uh, Dr. Moya just said now, um, and I'm going to bring it back to some I get something from my experience. So I went out to to do outreach in Kailicha years ago, and Kailicha is like a township in Cape Town. And so I was with my other colleagues, and I was the only Black female within the team that we went, went there to do the the outreach at and you know we are talking astronomy we are talking all of these things and it's really nice and it's fun and one of the kids just came up to me and like just pulled me out and then I went to them and said to me why do you look like me but you don't speak like me mm. and in that I realized that um, as much as there are so many things that we can do in astronomy even the language that we use for astronomy um, has to kind of accommodate the young kids that we're talking about. In South Africa, there are at least 11 different languages and cultures. Um, and so, you know, I spoke back to the kid in my home language while the kid also speaks a different language from me so that she can kind of understand that we're coming from different cultures. But I think there's a really space for us to also introduce how we communicate as astronomy in our different cultures, especially in Africa, where we are able to say, what I mean by a galaxy is this to someone else who doesn't actually understand that. Um, and it, it's not that it's uncommon in South Africa that you find places and kids who speak a different language. It's not really uncommon. We find that in some rural areas in South Africa, 
kids are being taught, you know, your maths and your physics in their home language and they come to university and they have to kind of get into this culture um, of speaking English and learning things in English. But I think there's an opportunity for us also to start taking these stories because these stories are told in our home languages and also include them into curriculums and astronomy so that we are able to communicate uh, astronomy effectively to other people as well. So I think there's really so much of change that needs to be done within the language that we use also in astronomy. In South Africa, we've already tried with that, with the telescopes that Tana has mentioned up in Sutherland, you know, apart from the salt, we have the 1.9 millimeter telescope, which is, has now been re renamed Lisedi, which means light in, you know, Lisedi is light in English. So there's also Mogodi. So we are trying to include even in the naming of these telescopes to say, this is what we are looking at um, so that people can also understand this. So I think there's something that we need to do in language as well. Yes, I'm so happy you hit on, um, you asked y'all actually hit on the other question I was going to ask. So I'm not even going to ask that question because y'all hit on it so much, especially Tia talking about like the different cultures and stuff like that. It was mainly talking about um, the next question I was going to ask and it's up to y'all and we can move forward if y'all don't want to answer it. Uh, basically, tell me a time where you learned something um, from a different group within the diaspora. So not your culture. But another group, such as Jamaican, African American, Black British folks, that has stuck with you and it helped you. I have one uh, that I've, I've learned through folklore as I was studying uh, Yoruba lore. Um, so that Yoruba being a like a Nigerian ethnic group. Uh, or like West African ethnic group and specifically their version of like reincarnation uh, is different from other versions of reincarnation that I've seen where kind of like instead of the the kind of karmic idea where you come back as a creature that represents how well you lived in your life before uh, in in Yoruba reincarnation you come back as your own descendant so you're incentivized to live a good life so that you can pass on prosperity to your own family line because you're essentially going to be your own great, 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 great grandson or daughter or whatever. And um, th that is a a type of folklore that I haven't seen kind of encode multi-generational motivation to be good to yourself. I haven't seen that in in other folklores that I've studied. And, and that was really nice. I I, re mm. I remind myself of that when I'm trying to think about how to live my life these days. Yeah, because and the reason why I thought this question would be so impactful, because, again, um, if if any folks from the IAU are watching this that we've met, I have this. And I think Tana, uh, not Tana, uh, Moya, I think you were there, but I don't think you was around when, when I had the conversation with some of the folks from um, ASAF and the uh, IAU. And I told them like, we're cousins. And they're like, yes, we're cousins. I was like, okay, I'm glad we got that settled. And they think <laughs> I'm a hoop now, which I'm really happy they think that. Uh, <laughs> and so, but like, I wanna make sure that like, you know, we bring this together because at the end of the day, we are technically cousins, right? And so by black law, right? Regardless if you're over in Africa or you're over in Jamaica or wherever you are, we are cousins, like my people are from the Martinique. So therefore, you know, I have to make sure that I, whatever I learn and I'm starting to learn about my own culture, I want to make sure I learn it from like Tana's culture and um, Tia's culture. So that's why I thought this um, in question was extremely important. Uh, Tana or Tia, did you want to answer? Tana, you can go first. Um, for me, I don't have a specific folklore from the diaspora, but something that really, and it seems obvious, but um, apparently it wasn't to me, that I learned um, about th that kind of made me feel a connection and investigate how I see the world is the, when we started to think about, um, and this is kind of, again, now encroaching on Sia's work, um, textbooks, especially astronomy textbooks with illustrations um, in South Africa and in Australia and in places like Brazil. Now we were showing the northern sky and this idea that obviously the sky looks different depending on where you are in the earth, uh, on the earth's surface and uh, the and how the, the, sh the different shapes 
of the constellations will be interpreted differently by different people and lead to different cultural practices and different beliefs. We're looking at the same sky, but we're interpreting it differently because our positionality is fundamentally different, but it's still the same sky and what you can and can't see from different parts of the, so the surface of the planet. So I spend a lot of my time in the Northern Hemisphere and uh, because I spend a lot of my time in the Northern Hemisphere in what I call potato Europe, where it rains a lot, um, you don't get to see the night sky because it's often very cloudy. Uh, so they do a different kind of astronomy than you can do in places where it's not cloudy. Uh, but when you think about how um, certain constellations will be oriented differently if you are an indigenous person in the um, Amazon jungle versus if you are a Torres Strait Islander of the coasts of Australia um, versus even North Africa versus South Africa because the African continent spans the two almost half and half in the North and in the South and how we are looking at the same sky, interpreting it, interpreting it differently due to our different positionalities. And, um, but there's still a, a surprising amount of convergence on we all decided that these things are, what we see in the sky is important, what we see in the sky is useful, um, and what we see in the sky can shape our lives here on the planet. So there's a difference, but there's also a great amount of unity. And that's something that um, you don't really appreciate until you go somewhere and you see with your own eyes that the sky looks different. And I've been extremely fortunate in my career to be able to experience that firsthand. Yeah. I Again, piggybacking on Tana. Definitely the first time I saw the North, uh, the North Sky with my own eyes was like two years ago when I was in the US and in Canada. But throughout in my textbooks, I learned about the North Star. They taught me about stars <laughs> from the perspective of the North Sky that I cannot even see outside my door. So definitely that was um it will help for me. Um answering the question, I wanted to say that um because I'm uh you know, I was born just before apartheid ended in South Africa, and I was very fortunate to grow up with a lot of TV and media. Um I was very much um, exposed to American culture from South Africa. Um, I don't know, many of the movies that I saw were really American movies. Um, you know, my English accent, I wanted it to be a little bit more American because, you know, the American dream. <laughs> uh, so to be honest, it fascinated me so much. Just the U.S. fascinated me so much when I was younger. And when I went to the U.S. for the first time, I went to Provo, which is in Utah. <laughs> and it was not close to a picture of America <laughs> that, <laughs> that I saw on TV or anywhere else. And to my disappointment, I was really waiting to see Black people and be like, what's up? Not and Utah. I, I, really excited to see that and instead what I got was I was a nice chocolate you know someone in the supermarket saying oh you're such a nice chocolate and I was just like this is definitely not <laughs> appropriate <laughs> and you know I need to be out of here um but once I was out of there and you know I was I went to DC and once I was in DC I saw a huge diversity a lot of people and as I was talking to to people then in DC I realized that oh no we are actually the same you know um we have some history that is similar to one another I I mean I went so deep in learning about um the history about slavery in the US, you know, which is something that South Africa didn't experience, but only the Northern part of, uh, of Africa experienced a lot of sla slavery. And once I went deep into learning about those things, I was just like, oh my goodness. Oh my, the, you know, that was just really a moment that stuck with me. And even more so, you know, this week in Black and Astro Week, Black and Space Week, it was so significant for me when it's taken place in a week where, you know, we are celebrating the, the, the freedom of slavery, you know, you like Juneteenth. And also in South Africa, you know, the start of this June 16, it is such a memorable day in South Africa because the students in June 16 in South Africa, in Soweto, marched against apartheid regime, marched against the learning and being forced to learn in Afrikaans and in their culture. So we are so connected in so many ways that if we focus on being different, 
we never going to realize what unites us all. So I think if, if there's one thing for sure, all of these things for me encompass what in South Africa we call Ubuntu, you know, you are a person because I'm a person. I am because you are. And mm -hmm. that whole thing of, you know, being one within the culture. So, which is which is why it was really easy, even in my story, that my mom's friends were able to send newspapers to me because I am because we are. And I think I see a lot of that even within our spaces as astronomers, especially Black astronomers, but also when we go into conferences and we see people that look like us, we, we get so excited. Like I'm excited if there's two black people and I know they're gonna sit together and they'll be talking together like they know each other for 10 years or something like that. But that's because we really have something innate in us that really unites us all. Oh man, that was so well said Tia. And also the running theme is what I said before y'all, we cousins. That is a little <laughs> running theme. <laughs> like we are cousins. And so like, no, like we have such a unique bond in such a um, shared experience. And that's some of what they were talking about yesterday on the um, Space Humanities panel, like one struggle is all of our struggle. And we actually have, you know, regardless of what, we still share the same similar stories. Um, so I'm gonna go to our next question. Um, this year's uh, IAU conference will be in Cape Town, South Africa. This is the first time that we've seen Africa spotlighted on this magnitude in astronomy. Are you excited? What do you wish to see more from the community regarding celebrating and embracing Af Africa's beautiful culture? And I'm gonna start with Moya on this question. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna punt because I unfortunately can't go. Uh, and I just, I've, all of my feelings are FOMO and jealousy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you, you should go ahead. <laughs> I feel like I'm jealous. I'm, I'm so jealous. jealous. <laughs> I, I wish I could go. Yeah. You are definitely missing out. <laughs> Rub it in. Why <laughs> don't ahead, you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh man. I think, um, for the IAU, International Astronomy Union, to be an organization that have already existed in 100 years. Number one is such a disgrace that they're only coming to Africa now. <laughs> um, and number two, it's I'm not impressed by the fact that, you know, even when they come to Africa, it, it's in their own terms, in their own conditions, you know, like it's happening in August. It's bad weather in Cape Town. Why, why would you want to be in Cape Town when it's raining? But no, people come to Cape Town still, sorry. You should still come to Cape Town. Um, so <laughs> definitely those are the two main things that are that I find disappointing about it in that sense. But I'm really excited that it's finally coming. So it is here and it's coming. I'm excited to see what kind of legacy will the IAU and the G the General Assembly leave even for, for African astronomy? Is it just everyone coming for a conference and going away? Or are they coming and there'll be something that sustains and keep on being there as impactful as it should be? Um, we are definitely, I'm definitely looking forward to all the speakers and all the talks and all the diversity of science that's being done you know, astronomy across all multi, multi-wavelength astronomy, as we have a multi-wavelength white paper in South Africa. Um, I'm really excited to hear about all of those affordances. Um, but I think it would be great if it goes one step further, you know, um, and I think this, this General Assembly, what it's going to do is something that has also never been done before, you know, they are trying to make more, um, more accessibility efforts, you know, uh, for understanding that it's number one, very difficult to travel right now because it's expensive, but it's also very difficult for people to even get visas to South Africa for some other countries. And so for those people, for them to be able to join the, the, the GA, obviously online, but you know, making more affordances that even their experiences, even though they're joining online, they actually get the conference experience as well. So I think I'm happy that that legacy is still happening. But I'm also happy about people who are coming and will be joining some outreach projects, some science communication projects, because they're not only coming in to see the scientists, but they'll go to see communities where some of these scientists come from. 
someone like me comes from those communities. And I think it will be great for people to come and engage with those communities and learn from those communities. South Africa has amazing food. So I hope that everybody can come and also enjoy some of the food and the entertainment that we're going to have. So I'm really excited that it's here now, but I hope it's not the last one that happens in the African continent. Yeah, I'm really, we have a, um, we do have a session um, that will be hosted by um, my, one of my amazing social media direct, my amazing social media director, uh, Cheyenne Polis, who is actually watching this right now. Um, and so shout out to Cheyenne and Dr. Chris Moore, who is currently in Japan at the um, SPIE um, Astro Conference. So they will be there. So please be on the lookout for them. And I am just going to pitch that we should just do another conference. I mean, we should do it at a time where it's going to be hot and it'll be cold here. So then that way we can have an excuse to go there because that will yeah. just make sense. And then just center us versus, you know, but we can mm -hmm. talk about that more because I have ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Tana, go ahead. <laughs> Um, I might also have to pass on this because I will not be attending, although I will be in Cape Town because it is my hometown and I will be celebrating a big milestone birthday. So I can only um, invite you to after parties. <laughs> I will not be prepared for the science content, but I'm there to turn up. So uh, <laughs> come through. She said, if you want to come to my party, she said, if you want to come to my party, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Y'all welcome, but I'm not going. That's the theme party that makes you feel better. But yeah, I'm I'm there for the for the vibes, not for the work that we. <laughs> yes. Is, that, is, that, that is the quote of the day: the vibes, not the work. <laughs> but also for, for people that are coming through and you know would like to go see salt and see the the best view of the Milky Way you could ever see with your naked eye, you know, this is a great opportunity to come. It's it's going to be amazing. So yeah, I look forward to having everyone there. Just for some, for some context, SALT is the Southern African Launch Telescope and it is a 10 meter class telescope. So the mirror is 10 meters big. And then in that same area, we have the Meerkat Radio Telescope. Um, so the, uh, yeah, the Karoo area of South Africa is home to two of the world's best telescopes, one in optical and one in the radio. So it's definitely worth going out there, even for just one of them. But you you could technically do both as well in one trip, which would be definitely worth your while. Now, we've discussed all um, cultural astronomy and its beauty and its glory. We talked about things that we learned from other cultures. We talked about things that make this culture amazing and why it should be more Afrocentric, right? Um, but one thing that I do want to ask before we start wrapping up, um, because I have another question after this, and then we can head to the Q&A. What, what are some of the most important values that we as a culture can learn from cultural astronomy, especially the ones that are in, in indigenous cultures in Africa. Um, I'm gonna start with Tana. So the values that we as black people bring to, to science, I think um, astronomy is a, we talk about astronomy being this global effort, right? this global science, and it's all about working together and things like that. And that is something that is, um, at the core of black culture. The um see how already talk, talked about Ubuntu and the spirit of like, you know, we are we're very community oriented, we're very um uh yeah, we're very community oriented, very family oriented. Um and so that is something that we could pay a bit more attention to in our global efforts, um, in the way that we treat uh each other, in the way that we treat the land that we are doing the astronomy on. Um, there's a lot of, um, I've mentioned this before, but there's a lot of um, replicating of colonial structures in astronomy in terms of where we build our telescopes. I just bragged about these two amazing telescopes in South Africa, but they are built on unceded indigenous land, just like they're trying to do in Hawaii and Mauna Kea, um, just like they're doing in Australia with the rest of the square kilometer array, um, unceded um, Aboriginal land, um, just like they've done in South America in places like Chile, um, we, basically, the, the best places to build um, 
ground-based astronomy, large-scale astronomy installations on unceded indigenous land. So we don't, there's certain people who we just completely disregard their land and ownership rights, and sometimes their fundamental human rights, because we feel that astronomy needs are more important than human rights, which when you say it, sounds absolutely wild and wrong and gross and bad, and it is. So what we can bring to the culture of research is more respect for each other in that way of like we are all part of the same community and we're not going to get there unless we all pull together you know there's the classic african problem that says if you want to go fast you go by yourself but if you want to go far you go together mm. and if yeah. you want to go far and astronomy is all about space and distance we want to go to mars we want to you know put, uh, we want to go back to the moon we want to go um, interstellar and intergalactic and we're not going to go far unless we go together unless we really tap into that spirit of collectivity and ubuntu and treat each other right here on earth first yeah and that goes just it goes beyond the science but we can um as a global astronomy community under one sky we are really uh, can be at the forefront of practicing that so that we can go far hmm. All right, uh, Tia. Yeah, and I just want, again, adding on to what Tana said, I think if there are some values that we could learn from those cultures and like Ubuntu that we've already mentioned, I think it's having those values also being part of the spaces where we do astronomy. So not just in the land where we where the telescopes are at, but in the offices where we are sitting, you know, we, we go to universities that are not even close to representing who we are. Uh, they are not necessarily conducive spaces for us. And so even the culture and the space within the offices where we do and practice astronomy and where we are with other astronomers, I think that on its own sometimes is quite toxic. And we have people saying, I'm going to leave academia. I don't like astronomy anymore. Um, I feel oppressed, you know, or this and that. I think that even values from our own African values and such as Ubuntu, a respect for nature and respect for others, those should be things that we add into our everyday practices and our everyday cultures within our office spaces as well. Um, I went to to a talk and someone, you know, asked the question not in a very nice way. And later on, I said to them, he said, I'm a, such a nice person. Why do people never come to me? And I said, no, you're not a nice person. <laughs> you're quite mean because of how you say your comments. Because but I wanted, I was really being genuine in this. And I said, yes, I understand. But the way in which you phrase this is not okay. And then he said, in a science space, if you need to have a thick skin, no, you don't need to be to have a thick skin. You don't have to be mean. And I think sometimes we've accepted this mean behavior, this abuse, this power dynamic to just say that we are better scientists, but actually you can really do good scientists without being mean and without being like that. So I think even the culture of the spaces where we do astronomy has to change. And one of the ways that it can change is by borrowing some of values from indigenous astronomy back into our offices, yeah. I just wanna say that was a word. Tia, you have been preaching this entire time, okay? We don't have to look. We don't have to. We don't have to work with you on it after this, because girl, you yeah, we got you. And I just <laughs> want to say, so my advisor, who is Asian, he often, um, and I just and I'm and I'm saying that because the connection there, regardless of who you are, for us people of color, we tend to like if we see something, we're like, yeah, you're not a nice person, da 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 da, right? And my advisor literally said it pays to be nice to people. And even one of my other mentors said, sometimes you don't have to be a jerk, just be nice to people. And that has been the, literally the common thing for me throughout the year. Because if you're not a nice person, if you're out here um, doing things to students and, and not watching your tone and not being, um, and you're not being, and you're being condescending and you're, you know, um, just pretty much putting these students and other faculty, if we, you know, since we, we want to go there, right, down, people won't want to work with you, and then you're trying to figure out why. And so I'm so happy that you brought that to the table, because that is a very, very important piece 
And I, that's something that we do want people to walk away with. Like, it's okay to be nice to people and not internalize the abuse that has been inflicted upon you. Yeah. Um, Moya. Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> I think t two values that we could adopt that would help us kind of decolonize the, the mindset that we have in research culture here but society more broadly um are two that i've already touched on duality and i guess i'll call it sustainability or like ethical consumption uh but on the duality side of things th there's this cultural practice in like a western lens of black and white thinking um and i think we would all benefit from thinking more in a in a dual way, understanding that two things can exist at once, that two truths can exist at once, um, especially when you're talking about people who exist at the intersections of different identities and different disciplines and different beliefs. And like there are just so many ways where multiple thoughts can exist in our head at once. And this this comes from folklore. I mean, there were there were so many deities who are both uh, male and female in in terms of their energies in in folklore and in African folklore. The the Yoruba creator spirit Aloran is is both male and female. Uh, the Dahomey creator spirit Mawulisa is both male and female and they can split up and they can come back together. But they're all always both, which is beautiful. Um, and on the ethical consumption side, I think it's obvious that there's a, a practice of overconsumption um, in Western cultures. When I look back at how different indigenous groups and African groups saw and studied the sky, um, even just the practice of having dark constellations to me shows that you're willing to make something out of everything that you have, not just the stuff that you can see, uh, but also the taking advantage of the negative space and really making use of everything that you have available to you. Uh, we need to do that more over here. Oh, that was well said as well. Like that is something that, you know, that is why Black and Astro exists, right? That is exactly why we exist because we did not, you know, as most of you know, there are not that many of us over here on, on the Western hemisphere that are astronomers that are black. Um, and so we're hoping to find more of us. And so making that statement, um, Moya was very, very powerful. And so as we're concluding to our, um, to our question, uh, we're going to our questionnaire. Um, where can people find y'all? Uh, go ahead, Moya, you can go first. Yeah, I'm Go Astro Mo on all the socials, and my website is moyamctier.com. Uh, there are a few things of mine you can check out. I host two podcasts. One is um, about fictional world building. So if you like sci fi or fantasy, this is for you. It's called Exo Lore, E X O L O R E. And then my other podcast is for people who are curious about astronomy but a little intimidated by it. And it's called Pale Blue Pod. It's a Carl Sagan reference. And uh, I also, the picture that I showed earlier while Tana was talking about the uh, the myth about the girl throwing uh, the sparks up into the sky is as an illustration from my book, uh, The Milky Way, an autobiography of our galaxy, uh, where I tell the story of the universe, but from the galaxy's point of view. It's very sassy um, and and pretty fun. So that's that's me. You can find me at Go Astro Mo. See ya. Uh, people can find me on Twitter. Yes, I'm on Twitter at Doctor of Moon. <laughs> and then I'm also on Instagram at Tiamiso Maguela and on Facebook at Tiamiso Maguela. But you can also always email me at maguela at astrofoedu.org, which is if you want to talk anything, astronomy education, uh, whether you want to know where you can upload the materials that you've used for your classrooms, or if you want to know more about some of the work that I do at university level, you can always email me there. And I'm really shy, so you might not. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. <laughs> Tana. Um, you can find me on I think it's Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Tana D for Delta Joseph. Um, I'm not so much on Facebook anymore. Uh, my website is astrocoms with two M's, astrocoms.com. Uh, you can find out all my 
work that I do um, around astronomy and um, decolonization, et cetera. Uh, I'm mostly on Twitter. I'm also on Reddit, but that's, that's uh, <laughs> if you can find me on Reddit, that'll be amazing because um, I've hidden myself very well, I think. But yeah, come chat to me on Twitter or on Instagram. Um, I like hearing from people. I like hearing people's um, interesting takes is always fun. Uh, the creativity of the human mind around um, Star Law and astronomy is um, always fascinating. So yeah, come say hi. Okay, we have one question. The rest are like um, comments and their praises. So the first question, um, uh, the first question is: As I listen to your beautiful stories, um, I am wondering if you will produce something in form of a video to share um, in schools. I am so moved. How can we bring your? How can we bring you to spaces to share your journeys? Anyone can go ahead and answer. Um, I'm always up to be on podcasts, love being a podcast guest. Running a podcast is very hard, uh, but I love being a guest on podcasts. Um, and yeah, if you go to astrocoms.com, you can contact me on the contact form. I do school talks. Um, it's free for state schools. Um, always happy to chat to um, young people, with, uh, even though it's very scary because children ask the most probing questions. Um, so it's always a bit nerve wracking uh, talking to kids, but it's good for me. I, I think it keeps me humble. <laughs> so yeah, podcasts, school talks, um, events like this. Uh, I, I love an Instagram live situation as well. Um, so yeah, find me on the socials or on my website and um, let's figure something out. Yeah. Hey, you have, yeah. A lot of people are, are just like, um, have one for a book rep. Um, about um, Native science and the, from Cheyenne Smith, who runs um, who runs an organization for uh, in space. And so I told her we will we'll be highlighting her this week. So we'll, so be on the lookout for that, guys. Um, for Divya, who was on yesterday's um, panel, she says, "No questions, just processing this wonderful discussion." Um, she had to go, but she wants to thank you all for this amazing panel. Um, and so, someone, um, an anonymous question that we did get is: They're interesting to hear more about light pollution and how humanity has lost its touch with the sky because of it. To what extent does it affect the indigenous communities in the diaspora? Anybody want to take that one? Yeah, that's that's a uh, great question. You you want to go ahead, Sia? You can go ahead, Maya. I'll go okay. to you. Yeah, my uh, the eighty percent statistic that I said earlier comes from the Dark Sky Association, and they've estimated that uh, eighty percent of the sky has like diminished view of uh, stuff in the sky, and so it definitely can disconnect indigenous groups from cultural practices that they can't see different objects um, if they are still relying on seeing certain things come in the sky at a particular time of year to like mark a celebration or a ritual or something then that is um, affected but it is usually strongest in like urban areas right I, I live in New York City I can see maybe like 10 stars on a good night um, but a lot of groups this is this is not like a hard and fast rule, more like a, a rule, a general rule. But a lot of the groups that would still be practicing those those rituals are probably closer to dark sky spots. So I don't think we can we have to be so totally hopeless here and say that they've all lost their connection to the sky. Yeah, no. And I think it's similar in in South Africa where people actually take time. So, for example, um, winter time is such a great time for people to actually go to the mountains, whether to pray or to do whatever ritual. And at that mountain, then it is dark and then they can get clear skies. So I think people still, um, you know, they know that where they are at because a lot of people live in urban areas because of work and all of those things. They know that there's somewhere that they could go um, and they'll have a, a very nice night sky and actually you know light pollution really does diminish our seeing uh, you go 10 minutes out and then you see the most beautiful stars than you'd ever do so I think people are now more and more aware that we see a little 
of stars when we are in these areas and we see more stars uh, when we are in in rural areas or when we go to the mountains which is something very popular in south africa especially now in winter not in cape town but like the other part of south africa where it doesn't rain in winter they actually go to you know to long trips uh, for for churches for rituals for circumcision rituals and all of those things they go straight to the mountain so that's still something that at least they do have until we try to build a telescope on a mountain mm. <laughs> tara um, I think Tia and Moya kind of covered it um, already. I will also say that um, specifically, again, around Indigenous people, as we said, we build a lot of um, astronomy installations on Indigenous land. And um, that actually, one of the benefits um, around that is that um, in places like South Africa, we have laws around um, limiting light pollution and not just light pollution, um, radio frequency interference, um, and things like that, that uh, will prevent the telescopes from working properly. So a lot of indigenous land is actually being preserved in a way, especially specifically from um, pollutions um, in the sky that prevent you from perceiving the sky, whether by um, visible light or radio light or different kinds of light. So uh, we are working very hard to preserve these areas. Um, to keep them, to keep the skies pristine and keep them beautiful uh, for the indigenous people of the area, for other local people, um, for astrotourism, um, et cetera. So, they, yeah, so there's a lot of conservation effort happening and it's mostly urban areas that are affected um, uh, uh, by, affected by like pollution and other kinds of pollution as well. Um, so there is one upside to that. It uh, doesn't obviously negate all the other harms, but we do have specific laws protecting these areas. Thank you so much. Um, okay, we have um, another question. Um, so what are you all thinking about the use of technology, um, namely pretty much predominantly um, AI? in other generated images making tools um, that sensationalize space images ver versus actually viewing them with the telescope, our eyes, um, hmm. for example, like Sea star for example. Anyone want to take that one? I have quite strong opinions on generative AI. Um, Go ahead. Um, first of all, a lot of these generative AI companies are not making the images or the text or the video or whatever in an ethical way. They are stealing from artists and then repurposing their work for profit. So uh, I don't feel good about generative AI in almost all cases. But specifically in astronomy, I, I think that it will give, it will misinform. It will show people the wrong types of images about space that aren't realistic. People already have a hard enough time understanding physically what's going on in images when we color them as astronomers or when we like try to add extra information, it's already hard for the public to, to parse that. So I think it is just irresponsible. And I think it's going to, it will like so much with generative AI, if the market is flooded with these false, with this false content, then the real stuff becomes less exciting and less accessible to the public. Um, Hubble, JWST, um, other other telescopes have given us beautiful images. We don't we don't need anything else. Like those are good enough. And I wanted to say that astronomy is not just about beautiful images, right? Those beautiful images are meant to communicate something, and so these images are generated so we can see what's in there that we don't know or see what is in there that we know and we need to know more about now. So these images really still the knowledge that we are trying to get from these, these things. So there's actually nothing that they add. They add nothing except for vibes, as Tana said earlier on. <laughs> um, and confusion. But, and confusion and yeah. And misconceptions, everything that we don't necessarily want in science. Um, so definitely not a fan of generative AI. I'm really a fan of people going out there, taking the data and generating these images that actually communicate something. Tana? Um, again, uh, Tia and Moya already covered a lot of this. I will also just add on to say that, of course, we 
as scientists, we love tech and um, you know, having the, the latest cutting edge thing, we're often early adopters and we use a lot of um, machine learning, not generative AI, but machine learning processes in sorting through our enormous data sets. Um, we have robotic remote operated telescopes and things like that. So we're not against technology, but what we are advocating for is the responsible use um, of, a, of generative AI in particular. And I think we can kind of draw an example with what we saw in COVID around a lot of misinformation that cost people their lives. Um, so you can see the that's an extreme example of um, scientific misinformation and the impact that it can have and is still continuing to have in society. And the people who suffer most from that tend to be uh, marginalized people, black people, indigenous people, uh, vulnerable people. And so while it's not as obvious necessarily what that means for astronomy, um, it might not be that kind of public health impact. We do need to be careful about um, being aware that this is out there. And we as astronomers also have a responsibility to educate people to um, think a bit more about media literacy and how to, how to spot fakes and things like that, because it makes our job harder, it makes everyone's job harder. And we are fighting against a rising tide. You know, AI is here, it's out of the box now. Um, and how do we respond to that is something that we as astronomers need to really seriously think about um, so that we don't make the same mistakes in science communication um, again. And so I have two questions, two more questions. They keep coming off. <laughs> and we love this, right? Um, is there any work being done to preserve Black and Indigenous cosmologies, especially those of cultures where the language is struggling to survive? Anyone for the answer? Yeah. Yep. So there, there is work being done on this. People like obviously like Moya is doing this work. Um, we mentioned uh, Professor Jurita Holbrook, um, yeah. who is doing a lot of work in uh, preserving um, the folklores around astronomy um, across the African continent, um, ethno astronomy, um, others as well. And there's a lot of work being done. Uh, you just mentioned the language there um, on the language on developing the vocabulary of astronomy, of science. Um, and that is a big part of decolonization as well, because our languages in the time of colonization were stolen from us. We were prevented from um, expanding them and, and, you know, um, and communicating using them. So building that capacity back in the actual vocabulary is so important. And there are people doing lots of interesting work around that um, all over the world, um, in South Africa in particular, and uh, someone that I um, have worked with a little, but not in astronomy, but in paleontology, is a Zulu-speaking South African who um, is inventing the um, language around paleontology in, um, in Zulu. And so he, for instance, invented the word for dinosaur in Zulu. He came up mm -hmm. with that word like a few years ago because it didn't oh. exist in the language and so we are actively building up the scientific vocabulary as we speak because it is so it is so crucial and fundamental fundamental in our culture um and for us to be able to fully participate in science as well yeah um i can also add and say that the oae the office of astronomy for education is also working on a multilingual glossary where they are trying to have, you know, all astronomy concepts existing in different languages. So right now, you know, the English one already exists, but, you know, we've already started um, translating some of these things into different languages. African languages is difficult because of the spread of cultures across Africa, but we are getting there. Um, and I think a few years ago, we also hosted something similar to this seminar where we were just talking about indigenous astronomy with people from different parts of the world. And people are really trying to document this astronomy. There is a South African book called Venus Rising, which is documenting the story of African cultures uh, with the stars. Uh, it's a really nice book that you can find online, or I have a PDF that I can share with Ashley and then she can share around. Um, and it really captures so much of the history of South Africa and the South African people with the stars. So there are so many efforts that are being made because indigenous astronomy is more than just nice poems. I wanted to mention that so much because sometimes 
some professional astronomers would look into indigenous astronomy not as a science, but just as nice stories and nice poems. But it is not just that. Those nice stories and nice poems offer context for us to learn the actual science. So that they are equally important. So work is being done in these fields. I love that. Um, I will just add that a, so ethnography is the field of folklore and anthropology that goes and, and observes and studies another culture. Um, and a lot of ethnographic work was done around Africa in the like 17, 1800s, but it was done in a frankly disgusting way. And so there is kind of a movement now for younger ethnographers and younger folklorists, especially ones from those cultures or who have some personal connection to it, to go back and uh, collect stories in a more respectful way without inserting their own uh, beliefs about it. Um, so it's a it's an active area of research. And a lot of it is through oral storytelling collection projects, uh, going around listening to people's stories and just trying not trying to interpret or analyze them but just collecting because that's the most important step right now uh cheyenne smith said that there are some folks over at big ben um conservation alliance that are doing some of this work um in relation to dark sky uh preservation on lands um, and i'm assuming that's here in the u.s if i'm thinking of big ben i'm thinking about indiana i'm more than likely <laughs> correct on that um all right, so this question will be our last question and we will let you all have your day back. Um, love this conversation. Uh, this relates back to yesterday's humanities conversation on all of it. On It's all about how we approach the situation with that being said, where do we place these um, observatories or not in efforts to respect and, conser and conserve indigenous lands, but also to co conduct science? Any thoughts? Um, can I go again? Um, that's a fantastic yes. question. Um, I think the first thing that needs to be done is consultation with the indigenous peoples because that's been the crucial thing that's been missing, right? Um, colonizers turn up and they do what they want to the people and to the land and to whatever they find in a place. And so the, and we see that so clearly with the protests around the 30 meter telescope, the TMT in Wanakia where there are already many telescopes, many famous big telescopes that professional astronomers use. And the question some people have is, well, why are you protesting now? And it's like, no, people have always protested. It's only now that we have social media that you can actually see these things. And um, people are not, they were never voiceless. We just were not listening to their voices. And so the first step is acknowledging that um, ind these the indigenous people have a right to decide how their land is used, um, what does that look like, what does this land mean to them, try and understand the cultural context, why is this important, why do they want to preserve their heritage, um, and then go from there and think about how do we minimize any negative impacts, what does compensation look like, um, you know, what are the long-term strategies, because um, the way that we are building these installations is often extremely extractive, it's the one way um, a one-way street about who benefits and a one-way street about who, um, you know, who is left with nothing at the end of the day. So that first step is acknowledgement and consultation and coming into it in good faith with a lot of actual respect. Um, and we as people all around the world can contribute to this consultation process um, by holding people accountable, by, you know, by being aware of these issues and um, paying attention to what's happening because our struggles are all the same. Um, as we say, none of us are free until all of us are free. And that means from indigenous land use all the way through to conflict zones um, and things that are happening around the world that are we can't turn our eyes away from. And we are all in this in this collective struggle, as, especially as Black people together. None of us are free until all of us are free. And that um, we need to keep that in mind when we um, when we even on things like astronomy that are seemingly unrelated and we don't have time but there's also a lot of said around astronomy and our close links with for instance the military industrial complex and how that feeds into um into conflicts and to furthering uh, colonial agendas around the world i think anyone else the, 
a word. Yeah, I think if there's something that I've been thinking about for long, and I think I've had a conversation with Tana about this, was ethics, you know? Do we really need to think about forming and formulating an ethics board that looks at these ethical practices that astronomers also do. You know, normally we say, no, astronomers don't need ethics because we're dealing with the sky. But actually, maybe it's time that we think of ways of introducing ethics, you know, doing our sciences ethically so that we are not harming people, we are not harming their land, we are not taking from people without giving anything back um, and things like that. So I think there's just a whole conversation on the ethics of science or the ethics of conducting astronomy that we need to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think astronomers need to acknowledge why it is that they want to build their telescopes on places that are so often extremely sacred to different cultures. Like they, I don't think astronomers have really reckoned with why there's that overlap. Uh, but yeah, the first step is getting consultation and then continuing it on, uh, making sure that it's uh, like local and and native people who who get to do the astronomy. So often the um, people will go in, they'll build an observatory, and then it's just going to be a bunch of white folks working at the observatory. Um, and so you need to get local people who who work in the observatory. You need to have some sort of compensation process so that the observatory feeds back into the community through training or through uh, mm -hmm. like some, some other form of compensation. It can't just be, like Tana said, extractive. Uh, so we, I don't think we should ever get to a point as astronomers where we say we have to build the telescope here. This is the only place for it, which is what they're doing and what they have been doing with the 30 meter telescope for so long. Instead, we have to get to a point where we say we would like to build a telescope here. These are the best conditions, but we have to work with the people in this space to make sure that it, it works for them. Well, that was a great way to conclude this panel. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email or, um, or you know, send a tweet or anything to the panelists um, because we are gonna close out. And once again, I wanna thank everyone for joining us this, this Black Space Week 2024. This has been a very special fifth year anniversary for us um, over at Black and Astro. Once again, I am your found, I am the founder and president of Black and Astro. Um, and thank you for joining us. And tomorrow is our last day as we celebrate Afrofuturism and Octavia Butler. So please join us while and, and please vote on your favorite Afrofuturism uh, drawings that is currently up right now. And so we have a little bit of things planned for tomorrow and we will be closing out the week, but this is our last panel. Thank you all so much for joining us. Happy Black Space Week. Bye. Thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you. Bye.